Well, good morning. Welcome. Thank you for bringing the church into this space this morning, Aletheia. If you guys would, let's stand as we worship our God together.
this morning. It's from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it. Altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. Father, thank you that there is nothing that we could do to outrun you. There's nothing we could do to make you love us more or to make you love us less. God, we want to acknowledge that it is true of us that we are broken and wicked and evil, but it is also true that you've paid for that. You've paid for that wickedness. It's already been done, God. We can't run from you. We can't hide from you. You see us wherever we are, and you see into our hearts as well, God. You see the depths of our hearts and our minds. Every thought is held in your hands. Father, we want to acknowledge that the very breath in our lungs is from you, that we are nothing apart from you, God. So would we be mindful each day that we are utterly and wholly dependent on you and that that is a good thing, Lord, that that is not a bad thing, that that is the reason that we can even live and be a part of what you have for us is because you sustain us, God. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. This next song um, is an older one. Um, it's, uh, we don't do it here very frequently, but I'm sure some of you know it. Um, but as you learn, as we sing, uh, feel free to sing along. Um, but it's about our dependence on God for everything.
speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as a flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what's played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if your tongue, you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what it said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, no one speaks in tongues should pray that he may interpret. The, the one who speaks in tongue in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but, built my, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do so? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law, it is written, by people of strange tongues and by lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. And even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophesy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, an outsider or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is, conv he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are, Lord, and I thank you um, for the teachings that you left us, Lord, and how you're constantly teaching us, Father. Um, I ask that today you prepare our hearts and, and our minds, Lord, to receive what you have prepared for us, Lord. I ask that you be with Kevin as he speaks and, and that we will receive what you have for us, Lord, today. I praise you for this last verse, Lord, that people will fall on their face and they will worship you because you are a God that is deserving of all worship and all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may grab a seat. Uh, parents, if you want to go ahead and dismiss your kids over here to stage right, uh, Charlotte and Gabe will take them off to uh, Alethea Jr. this morning. Um, if this is your first time with us or uh, you haven't had a chance to grab one yet and you would like a scripture journal uh, to be able to kind of follow along with what we're talking about this morning, just go ahead and raise your hand. We'll have some people hand those out to you. That's our free gift to you. Uh, here at Alethea Church, we love God's word. We love the Bible. And so we want you guys to have that uh, in your hands and to be able to uh, take notes or write down what God may be uh, speaking to you. I think we have somebody over here, Josiah, that, that wants one. So um, if you guys just keep your hand raised, uh, we will get that to you. Uh, for the rest of you guys, go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Um, that is where we're going to be this morning in our text. Uh, we've been working through this letter to the church at Corinth now for a couple of months, and um, I, I've said time and time again while I'm up here that this, this letter is centered around how um, Paul, Paul perceives and believes the church at Corinth should be living lives as people transformed by what God has already done in their lives. That um, there were things going on inside of this church that were unbecoming of the witness or the testimony that they claim to have as Christians or followers of Jesus. And so Paul's writing this letter to, to correct them. He's saying, look, you know, I, I spent time with you. I, I started this church. I know a lot of you. And I'm hearing testimony. I'm hearing uh, reports of what's going on in, inside of the church. And uh, it's, not, it's not in line with what I taught you. It's not in line with what you are professing to believe. And, and, and we, we said that it had started with divisions that were going in, on inside the church over fighting over who was the better preacher or teacher or leader inside of the church. And then he moved on uh, talking about kind of just relationship issues that were going on inside of the church that if the church, the body of Christ, is really called to be uh, God's family, God's people, that, that those of us that claim to be disciples and followers of Jesus, we would use language like having been adopted by God in Christ, that we are his children, that if those things are a reality, it means that there should be a real attempt, uh, a real walk with the Lord that, that attempts to right, love one another well. And, and then we said that starting at about chapter 11, Paul was going to have another major shift kind of in the tone and the theme and what he was attempting to communicate to this church in Corinth. And that was what, what it looked like for them to gather corporately to worship God. How they should act with one another, what they should be elevating, what they should be focused on, and, and how they were to live that out. And so he started off by, by just sharing how, first and foremost, that they should honor one another in the way that, that they gather in the corporate worship gathering. And then he moved into this idea of gifts and, and spiritual gifts. And what was the purpose of those gifts, uh, how they were supposed to be used, what was supposed to be going on. And then last week, Pastor Daniel kind of unpacked this idea of love being what drives the church. And, but we need to understand that what we saw last week and what Pastor Daniel kind of encouraged us in was that this idea of love still is supposed to be connected with kind of what we're doing right now. Like as we gather on Sunday mornings, what, how is the church to love one another? And more specifically in the context of the letter that we're, we're reading, how that fits into the idea of spiritual gifts. Now that idea of love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 has a lot of different applications. But the contextual application is how is the church to love one another well, Bear with one another, 
right? Show and display the love of Christ to one another. And what does that mean in, in light of spiritual gifts? And so what we're going to see this morning in the text and what Hoffa just read for us is it's going to seem like he's jumping back to talking about spiritual gifts again. But the reality is, is he's been talking about them this whole time since about chapter 12. There was just so much confusion going on inside of this church when it came to spiritual gifts, how they were supposed to be used, how they were supposed to operate, um, how we were to use them to build one another up that he had to, to really, really go in depth and talk about a number of different things so that they might understand how to move forward with these gifts. And so that's what we're going to see this morning. So let me, let me ask a question. Though. Let me pose a question. How many of you guys like the Marvel movies? Okay. All right. I, I'm convinced at this point that the only people that don't like the Marvel movies are movie snobs because they're the people that like watch the, like, the Oscar-winning movies and Marvel movies are never going to win an, an Oscar. But like for the people like me, that you know aren't going to watch those other movies cuz we we don't go to movie theaters. I love the Marvel movies. I grew up on them. And one of my favorite uh, Marvel heroes is Spider-Man. And I think I'm just now and and as I'm like rounding into middle age starting to understand why I relate so well with Spider-Man's character. It's because he has a really bad sense of humor. And so do I. So like there's this weird part of me that's like I could be Peter Parker. Like he says those bad jokes or whatever else is going on, and, and you'll see him, and, and you'll, you'll see, like, the villains even respond, like, this guy, what's wrong with this guy? Like, he's weird. Like, if you've watched the Avengers movie, everyone kind of looks at Spider-Man like, this kid, like, what's his problem? Like, he's not funny. He thinks he is, but that's cool. Just now imagine that's how I live my life, walking around that way. People look at me like, Kevin, you're not funny. Like, what's going on? So anyway... One of the things I loved about the Spider-Man movies, and there's a number of them, you know, a lot of you guys are probably only familiar with the latest w- couple ones with Tom Holland, who, who's the actor, but Tobey Maguire was the Spider-Man before. There we go. A few people know what I'm talking about. May the, may the Lord praise and lift up Gen X, right? So, one of the things I love about the character of Spider-Man, though, is the way in which he is portrayed as having this deep understanding of the responsibility he has with the power that he's been given. It's something that in his character arc, he is challenged with regularly. You know, if you've seen uh, the, the first Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire, Uncle Ben says to him, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Right? He, he teaches that lesson to Peter early on. Right, in the second movie, right, with Otto Octavius, right, Dr. Octavius says to Peter at one point, intelligence is not a privilege, it's a gift, and you use it for the good of mankind. And then, right, even in like the newer movies, right, and and, in Civil War, right, Peter's talking to Captain America and he says, when you can do the things that I can, but you don't, and then bad things happen. They happen because of you. Right? His character had this understanding that the gifts he had been given, the power he had been given, was not meant for himself, but was meant for the good of the world around him. Right? The common thread in the story of Spider-Man is that Peter has this special power, and it must be used for the good of others, not for himself. This is the same point that Paul is going to attempt to drive home to us in the text that we see this morning. That spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit, not for our pleasure, but for the good of others. You know, I've been a follower of Jesus now for a little over 16 years, and there's a lot of different expressions of the church There's a lot of theological disagreements between those different expressions of the church. And one of the main ways in which churches theologically disagree with each other is over spiritual gifts. What gifts are still active? uh, What spiritual gifts are supposed to be used? How are they supposed to be used? How do we apply them? One of the things I think I regularly see being missed in those discussions is not so much the theological application of what those gifts are or what they're supposed to look like, 
but what Paul talks about right here in 1 Corinthians 14, and knowing that that's in light of chapter 13, that if love and desiring to build up and serve others is not our chief goal as followers of Jesus, we'll miss the mark. No matter if we apply the gifts properly or not, if our chief goal is not to love others and build them up, we'll miss the mark. And so Paul's going to break down this idea of gifts not being for us, but for others. And he's going to use an illustration, and he's going to compare the gift of prophecy to the gift of tongues. Now, he's really strategic because those two gifts were the primary ones that were kind of causing issues inside of this church. But what, what, I, what I hope we'll see as we continue to, to work through this is, while those may not be the gifts we argue about as a church, or may not be something that's on the forefront of Christian thought right now in 2022, it doesn't mean that the application that we see from these verses does not reign true today. So let's look at the text, starting in verse 1. Paul says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. So, so as I said a few minutes ago, like what we read right here, especially in these first five verses, needs to be understood in light of what Pastor Daniel taught on chapter 13. And so if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you sometime this week, take, take, take 40 minutes, go sit down, listen to what Pastor Daniel taught on last week. Super, super important. But he talked about how love should drive us, right? And not, and not our own definition of love, but the biblical definition of love and how God describes that to us. And, and Paul's now bringing that back into this discussion on spiritual gifts and how we interact with one another in corporate worship. And he's saying that the way of love should be demonstrated by followers of Jesus, especially in exercising their spiritual gifts. And, that, and in that first verse, he kind of breaks it down in, in, in a practical flow of how we should view this. So basically what he's saying is, is, hey, when the church is gathered, so in our case on Sunday mornings, when we, the people of God, the professing disciples and followers of Jesus gathering together, we should be seeking to do a few things when we gather together. And he lists them in order there in verse 1. He says we should pursue love, right? I'm not going to go in depth on that, but Pastor Daniel completely unpacked that for us last week. So Paul says hey, the first thing that we should do when we gather together is we should pursue love, the second thing we should do is that we should earnestly desire the spiritual gifts together. Meaning collectively, as the church, we should all be desiring gifts. We should be desiring more of God, God giving us more. But then this third part, right, is where he starts to get a little interesting, especially that you may prophesy. See, what was going on inside of this church in Corinth is that they desired the spiritual gifts, but this church had become obsessed with one gift in particular, and that was speaking in tongues. To the point where some theologians actually believe that this church was teaching that if you couldn't speak in tongues, you weren't actually yet saved or a follower of Jesus. And guys, let me just say this. Some of you guys may have even grown up in environments um, that, that taught that theologically. It's not true. Right? Like, there, like you will see very, very rarely that even though like I have a, a strong bent to, to my own theology and what I believe to be true about Scripture, I tend to not call things out at least from the stage. But that particular theological position, in my opinion, is so problematic and so far from God's design and call on how he saves us through the life of Christ and such a misapplication of spiritual gifts and what God gives that I feel the need to call that out from the stage. That a church that would teach to you that you're not really a follower of Jesus unless you can speak in tongues, I would say is, is borderline heretical. 
right? Because what they're teaching you is that there's a certain elevation of these gifts and that if someone doesn't have them, you're less than. And what we saw even earlier on in in our uh, study of the Holy Spirit a couple weeks ago in our study of spiritual gifts is that the one who gives spiritual gifts is is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gives those and distributes this as he sees fit. And so if the Holy Spirit does not see, see fit to give somebody that spiritual gift, are we then to look at people as professing followers of Jesus Christ and claim to them, well, you're not a believer yet. And this is why I find it so problematic. And this church was struggling with this because what was happening, as they were doing in a lot of instances in this church, is they had this theological position on the gift of tongues, and they were alienating those who did not have the gift. To put it another way, they were taking everything that Paul said was important for the church to display in chapter 13 and kicking it out because of their theology. That their theology on the gift of tongues was leading to a lack of fellowship and love and therefore was reflecting poorly on the majesty and the beauty of what Christ had done for them. And Paul's charge to them is this. He says, tongues are good, but they have some limitations. And you guys have elevated this gift so highly. Let's talk about the limitations of this gift. Because really, when you think about it, tongues are only for men to God. Instead, right, you should focus on the gift of prophecy if you really want everyone to hold one particular type of gift. And his argument is, is if, if I speak in a tongue, and I've been given that gift, I'm the only one who understands what's being said. And even then, and Paul admits this later on in the chapter, you may not even understand what you're saying. That if you can't interpret what you're speaking, how do you know what you're saying? But he says, at, at, at best, right, without an interpreter, The gift of tongues is only good for the one who's speaking it in in their relation to God. Therefore, practically, if you're going to try to hold everyone to a gift, desire the gift of prophecy instead. Now, the gift of prophecy is, and if you go back to the original language and you look at the Greek, the word is this word propheteo. Right? And, it mean, and it means to speak forth divine in, interpretations. That's what it literally means in the Greek. And so it had all sorts of applications. But in Scripture, it meant to declare God's word and revelation to his people. That's how you see it frequently used throughout the New Testament. And oftentimes when, when we, right, as English speakers in 2022 in the West, right, hear the word prophecy, what do we think of? Oftentimes we think of Thinking about something that's going to happen in the future and being able to declare that ahead of time, right? So we'll think of someone like Nostradamus or all these other people that we think declared something in the future and then we try to go into history and find on whether they were right or not, right? That tends to be what we think prophecy is. And it can mean that, but that's not necessarily what the word meant in the Greek and it's not what the spiritual gift is supposed to mean. What the gift meant was more so being able to unveil God's word to people in a way that was understandable and would build them up. A modern day example of this would be the preaching of God's word at the corporate worship gathering. Right? Where where we gather as God's people together, we sing together, we encourage one another, and we then sit underneath the teaching of a pastor or a preacher who hopefully has spent the time studying God's word and will unpack it for us so that we leave encouraged by who God is and what he's done for us as his word is revealed to us. And so why... Would Paul elevate prophecy so highly in corporate worship? Well, he shares with us right there, right? He says, prophecy upbuilds, encourages, and consoles, right? It builds up those who hear it. It encourages us, and it comforts us. That when when the gift of prophecy is exercised properly, it displays love and service to those who are gathered, So the prophetic gift, according to Paul, has the ability to build up, warn, move the church to action, encourage us, and comfort the people who hear God's word. 
And here's how I know that this is true, okay? I'm going to use our own church as an example, right? Our, the expression of our church in our time of worship, we tend to be a little bit more subdued, okay? Like I've worshiped at Greenhouse and a couple other really great churches here in town, and there's some energy. And this isn't me banging on you guys or banging on the worship team. I just I, I know kind of what the, what the heartbeat of our church is. Right, And so I'll come in the first song, like, uh, we're still getting our coffee settled, and we're just kind of sitting here, and we're kind of getting ready, and then the call to worship happens at our church, and then, then I start to see a little bit more engagement, right? And I would say that's intentional, right? The Word of God has started to reorient you towards what's going on here, and then we'll get a little more engagement. But you know what I, 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 I love about our church? Is at least when we gather together on Sunday mornings, every week I see a build up. And people that are kind of just sitting there like this, and I'm guilty of this for the first three songs or whatever else may be happening, right? Pastor Daniel will come up here and preach a teach, or I'll come up here and preach a teach, or Pastor Theo will come up and preach a teach. We'll go through our reflection time. And the number of hands or interaction with worship after the preaching of the word of God more than doubles almost every Sunday. And you may have never noticed that before, but your pastors do, right? Why is that? It's because the word of God has encouraged you. If we've done our job up here from the stage using the gift of prophecy that God has given the people that come up here and speak on a Sunday morning, right? You should be encouraged. You should be convicted. You should be built up. Right? And guess what? When we have God's word kind of unveiled to us, how can we not be encouraged by it? Right? When we, 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 we go through long weeks. Right? Some of us have tough jobs. Some of us have tough family situations going on. Some of us are weary from so many things going on around us. And we come in here on a Sunday morning, and if God's word is unpacked and unveiled to us, it should be a balm of healing to our weary and worn down souls. And we hear the word of God unveiled to us. And we start thinking, you know what? Things aren't so bad. God's got this. I've spent the last six days trying to do this myself. God's got this. Right? And we leave built up and encouraged. And guys, this has nothing to do with the particular men who preach here on Sunday mornings. Right? Go over to Hebrews chapter 4 with me. Here's why I know this works. Because God promises it in his word. Look at verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 4 with me. For the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Right, if we are really, truly in Christ and followers of him, the reading, the teaching, and the proclamation of God's word will always build us up. It might be building up in different ways, but it will always build you up because you long to hear from your father. You long to be encouraged by your dad. And so Paul is saying here to this church, who's kind of got this, this wacky view of these gifts. He says, the gift of prophecy, guys, should be highly desired because it is for the building of the church, while tongues only builds up yourself. And he puts a caveat in there, unless there's someone there to interpret. Right, so let's, let's extrapolate this for a sef second and just stop and rest with this for a second. Because this has application across multiple gifts, right? Because here's, here's my fear, right? You, you hear me talk about these first five gifts and we leave this morning and say, well, I have to have prophecy then or I'm not building people up. And what, what Paul is trying to say to us is, hey, when we gather corporately, one, prophecy should be something that we elevate in the corporate worship gathering. But two, 
Gifts are designed to build up and love on others, not for ourselves. And that while tongues are a beautiful gift given by God, the application of that gift inside of this church had become self-centered, self-focused, and had missed the mark. And the call to us is to respond to this and examine our own lives and say, how am I approaching my interaction with the local church? Do I interact with the local church and do I connect with it in a way that is self-centered or in a way that asks questions about how I might encourage, love, and build up others in Christ? And I see this all the time, right? Right? One of, my, one of the favorite lines I've heard of all time is from Francis Chan. And he was teaching on worship. And he shared the story of this woman who walked up to him in his church. And she's like, he's like, hey, how are you? Like, it's so good to see you this week. Thanks for coming with us. And she's like, Pastor, I just have to be honest. Like, worship just didn't do much for me today. Like, I, I just didn't feel it. He said, I paused and I looked at her and said, well, that's good. It wasn't for you. Guys, we gather here this morning not for you, but for God. We gather to encourage one another to look at God. And that might mean we encourage one another if we're downtrodden or difficult. The Bible calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. But I didn't get up this morning ultimately for you. I got up because I want to worship my king. And because I want to worship my king, that means I want to love you well. But ultimately, I'm here for him. And this is how Paul is trying to reorient them. He's like, when you gather corporately together, it's God first, others second, and yourself third. And you have completely flipped that around. And you've made it about you, even in these spiritual gifts. And so he says, the gift of prophecy is a gift to be highly desired because it builds up the church while tongues build up self. Let, and then he says, let me unpack why. Right? We're going to kind of move through this part a little bit quicker, but he's going to give a couple different arguments on why this is the case. Right, when you look at verses 6 through 12, Hoffa read those th- for us earlier, so I'm not going to read them now. But look at what he says here in verse 6. He says, Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring to you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? He says, You won't gain fruit. You won't understand what I'm saying if I don't come to you speaking in a language that you already understand. And he gives a couple of examples. Right? So for the musicians in the room, they immediately understood this example. He's like, hey, if, a, if, a, if someone plays a musical instrument and just starts blowing notes on it, unless they play distinct notes, it's nothing more than a bunch of noise. He goes on to give another example. He says a bugle can't call people to war if it's not played properly. Right? In battle, there were certain things that a bugle would play to call people to do certain things at battle. And that's how they communicated changes during the battle. If they play the wrong notes, people won't do the right things. So tongues must be intelligible or, as Paul says, you're speaking into the air. Right? This is Paul encouraging them, strive not for tongues but for building up the church the same way that the bugle player strives to have the military united and what their next act is supposed to be together. And what we see in this over and over again is that all Christians can desire these gifts, but the the desire should be rooted in a place where we desire to serve others. This goes beyond just even spiritual gifts. It goes to our job, our family, that, that we should do, as we saw a couple weeks ago, all things with the goal of glorifying God and building up others in Christ. And the question would be is why? Because right? it's easy for me to sit up here and preach moralism and say, well, here's a list of things that God is telling us to do. Why aren't you doing them? But the reality is this. 
Why is Paul teaching this? Why is this such a big deal? Why, why did he feel like they had missed the mark? Because the example that Paul is calling them to, right? what, is, what is being unveiled to us is the example of Jesus. I mean, think about Jesus. He came, he emptied himself, put on human flesh, and then he spent his entire time on this earth loving and serving others, teaching, performing miracles, exhorting, consoling, encouraging, And ultimately, right, when you get to the end of the gospel accounts, you see that ultimately he does all of this not for his own glory, but for who? The glory of his Father in heaven. Jesus used his gifts to declare the glory and goodness of his Father and to serve his sheep. And Paul is calling Corinth... And God's word is calling us to examine our own lives, to examine our own desires, to examine the gifts that God has given us. Just like I said to you guys a couple weeks ago, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ in here this morning, you have spiritual gifts. And as David taught a couple weeks ago, you have a unique and important role to play in the family of God with those gifts. There are things that God has gifted you to do that he's not gifted me to do. God wants to use us to build up others, to love on others well and encourage them in the love of the Father the same way Jesus did as he walked this earth. And so as we approach this, right, if we look at verses 13 through 19, right, Paul's going to unveil to them how they should approach the issue of tongues in this church in particular. Look at what he says. He says, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he might interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing with praise with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind also. Otherwise... If you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, there has been a tendency in some traditions of the church to to teach that tongues are to be done away with altogether. Uh, But that's not what Paul's teaching here. Paul Paul is actually saying, he says, if if one who speaks in a tongue, then he should pray that one would interpret. And here's his approach at how this gift should be used in the church. He says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but the mind is unfruitful. I don't know what I'm saying. Therefore, pray for interpretation. Because it's not good enough just to sing with our spirit, but with our mind also. Let me, let me distill this down a little bit further, right? Because this is common, right? All of us in this room have been affected by postmodernism in some way, shape, or form. And so we think that ultimately what we feel is true, right? That's the great lie of, of, of this generation, right? We, we teach that only your felt experience or what you feel is true. Right? And I know some of you, you know, maybe even are, are, are big on the humanities and you're like, I don't like where Kevin's going with this. And here's what I would say to you. Right? I love philosophical inquiry and thinking through things and, I, and things that are self-defeating just drive me absolutely crazy. Right? And postmodernism is one of those things. Right? Oh, there's no objective truth. Well, one, that's an objective truth claim. Thank you. Well done. Right? But I always love that the primary places that those things are usually taught is at universities. Anybody else see the irony in that? What do you do when you go to a university? Some of you guys are at a university. It's okay for you to give me the answer. I'd love to hear it. Why are you there? Thank you. Right? You go to learn the truth about something. Right? What if I, what if you're going to be an engineer? 
and you rolled into your first week at the University of Florida at Santa Fe, and I said to you, hey, thanks for showing up. We're going to take tens of thousands of dollars from you over the course of the next several years. Nothing you learn here is actually true. There was like literal moaning there. Did some of you guys hear that? Guys, this is the prevailing attitude on many university campuses. Just so you're aware. Subconsciously being taught and sold to you as some higher form of enlightenment. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Because if it's true, you should immediately close universities. They have no, they have no reason for existence. Right? If, if there is no objective reality or objective truth, we live in the matrix. Right? We should live our lives eating and drinking and doing whatever we want for tomorrow we die. Yeah, but God's word unveils to us and says to us that there is an objective truth. That the God of the universe created all that we see and know, and he, devi- he defines what reality is for us, and we respond to that reality according to what he says. Now, you cannot like that. But just because you don't like that 2 plus 2 equals 4 doesn't make it any less true. Just because you don't like that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west doesn't make it not true. Just because I don't like that if I eat Taco Bell for every meal, I will likely be sick and weigh way too much within three months. Right? I'm not saying you have to like the truth or the reality of something, but it doesn't make it untrue. And we've gotten to this place where we teach that our own personal opinions and feelings and emotional responses to something are our ultimate guide in the universe, and it's not, guys. It's not. And if we do, it leads to a life of isolation and loneliness, and it leads to a life ultimately without purpose. Because the Bible teaches that you were created for a purpose, that you aren't some random accident, that you aren't the accidental splinting of an amoeba, but that God created you, designed you in his image and likeness to bear his image and display his glory to the world around him. That God created the very universe as we know it to display who he is and to display his glory. And therefore, going back to what Paul says here, it's not enough just to respond in our spirit or our emotions, but we must respond in our mind as well. Because the truths about who God says he is, and here's here's the important thing, are actually more encouraging than what made-up perception of him you want to have. Guys, I have searched far and wide. I've studied tons of world religions. When I was in college wrestling with the the claims of Jesus and who he said, I will promise you this, there is no claim made by any world religion out there as outrageous and as beautiful as the claims of Jesus Christ. And so we worship both with our hearts and souls and spirit, but also with our minds. And Paul says that this is why prophecy is such a big deal inside of the corporate worship gathering because otherwise others cannot rejoice with us in the beauty of the promises of God if we don't articulate them in ways that can be understood. That you can have an amazing testimony of God's faithfulness to you, but if it can't be understood, it doesn't build anyone up. I have a beautiful example of this just last week when I was in Columbia. It was an awesome trip. I hope to have the team uh, record a video for us in a couple of weeks, and we'll share that video with you uh, on what God did down there. But while I was down there, I went out to dinner one evening with a guy that was there one, on one of the first trips we went on. And he doesn't speak almost any English, and my Spanish is poor at best. Okay? 
So I took my friend Mario with me so he could interpret if need be. And as we were sitting there, he begins to share the story of what God had done in his life over the last several years. And I can tell, like, as he's holding back tears and just, like, with the look on his face that, like, something powerful happened. But guess what? I had no idea what he was talking about. My lack of understanding of Spanish and, and not having mastered the language yet led me to not understand the testimony that he was sharing with me. And so after he'd finished, I turned to Mario. I was like, okay, sum up what he said for me because I only caught about 40% of it. And here's what had happened. Over the last several years, right, God had healed him of cancer healed a bunch of relational strife that he had walked through, had, had brought a new found revelation to him that what Christ had done for him was sufficient. That Romans 8 spoke to him in a way that it had never spoken to him before. He'd gotten married. He was doing ministry with his new wife. And so many other things. And guys, like, when, as Mario's telling me this, guess what happened in me? My heart just soared, right? Seeing God's faithfulness to someone else, how could that not encourage me? Right? I had known this guy when he was younger. I had seen him struggling in his walk with the Lord and seeing God's faithfulness to him over the course of the last three or four years since I had last talked with him brought so much joy to me because seeing God meet other people and love them well encourages me to keep going. It reminds me that God's not just faithful to me, that he's faithful to others and that we can trust him. But had there been no interpretation, I could not rejoice. But because of the interpretation, I was able to worship God as I left that restaurant. This is what Paul has in mind that we speak and share as God's people with the goal of building one another up. And had there been no interpretation, I would have seen the passion. I would have known something happened, but I wouldn't have known what. But now I rejoice in what God has done in that young man's life. And Paul says this is the same for tongues inside the church. Right? That, they, that they may build up you personally, but if they don't build up the outsiders and those around you, then what purpose do they serve? And then he finishes up with this, starting in verse 20. He says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. He's wrapping up this thought, and this is what he says. Do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Right, so he calls them brothers. He's saying, hey, like, I, I, I planted this church with, I know you guys. You guys are in Christ. But then he says this, you're acting like children. Now, for those of you guys that don't have kids in here, let me tell you what it's like to have kids. Kids are often selfish, self-centered. They think the universe revolves around them. And when you tell them it doesn't, they push back. They just do. Uh, see the parents, like, yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and by the way, this does not stop me from loving my kids. It's one of those weird things that God does in the hearts of parents. Your kids are actually, like, evil. I mean, the Bible calls us all evil, right? So why wouldn't they? Just because they're cute doesn't mean they're not evil. But you still love them care for them, right? It's a small glimpse of God's heart for you. That amidst, in the midst of your self-centeredness and wanting to make the universe around you, your Heavenly Father still loves you. But as Paul unpacks this for them, he says, don't be children, right? Selfish and self-centeredness, right? And this is something Jackie and I are trying to teach our sons. We're, we're, we're foolish enough to believe as human beings, but especially as children, that selfishness and self-centeredness is a pathway to freedom and, and, and enjoyment. 
seeking gifts for our own glory and our own satisfaction, right? Which is exactly what the church in Corinth was doing. And Paul's like, that's childlike. Guys, we do this in so many ways. It doesn't just have to be spiritual gifts. It can be relationships, friendships, fame, success. But we run after all these things in a self-centered way, and when other people are experiencing what we want, we violate the 10th commandment and we start coveting. Guys, I've even seen inside the church people coveting other people's spiritual gifts, thinking that that person's better than them because of that and like children we seek gifts for our own glory and our own satisfaction thinking that it's a pathway to freedom and it's actually a pathway to enslavement this is why Jesus says things like it's more blessed to give than receive and whoever wants to be be the greatest among you must be the greatest servant Right? Like, Jesus doesn't just drop these lines because they're like truth bombs. He knows how we think. He's like, your natural way of approaching the world is going to enslave you and lead to misery and unhappiness. If you free yourself from the love of self and love of others, that's the real pathway to freedom. That's the real pathway to true joy in this life. And what was going on in this church is they were coveting this gift to the point where they were alienating others and disrupting fellowship. And Paul says, be mature. Stop being like children. He says, just like pause and think for a minute how this would even be perceived from the outside. Right? You are professing as loving one another and being God's children, and yet you treat one another as if you hate one another and are jealous of one another all the time. Like, how crazy is that? And then look what he says in verse 21. And the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even they will not listen to me, says the Lord. All right? Paul's alluding to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11 there, where the invading Assyrian army was, was coming in to conquer Israel, and that that was God's judgment on them for violating the covenant with God. But Israel could not even understand them because it was in a foreign language. So as God's judgment was coming, they didn't even know what was going on. They were confused. Right? Then look at verse 22. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers answer, will they not say that you are out of your minds? See what Paul's saying there? This, is, this can be confusing if you, if you just read those verses quickly and don't ponder what Paul's speaking about, especially in light of, of Isaiah 28. He says, tongues are a, are, are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. And just so most of you guys know, when I was talking about that particular theological tribe earlier that said that if you didn't speak in tongues, you weren't a believer, Paul's actually speaking to that right here in this verse. He says that tongues are for a sign for unbelievers, not for believers. But here's what you need. They're not a sign of faith. They're a sign of judgment. Right? Because what would happen if we were all speaking in tongues, we're all followers of Jesus come in here, and an unbeliever comes in, and they hear us speaking in tongues, what are they going to think? These people are crazy. What's going on? And instead of rejoicing and seeing God's presence in our midst, they're going to think that we're crazy and they won't fall and worship God. It's a sign of judgment falling upon them, not a sign of faith. And then he says this in verse 24. But if all prophecy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. He says, however, if the word of God is being unveiled and lifted up, it will build up believers and convict the unbeliever. He says, convicted by all, called to account, and that the secrets of the heart are disclosed, and falling on his face, he will worship God. 
Guys, before I was a follower of Jesus, my sister would not leave me alone. She, she was a new follower of Christ, and she just, hey, like, why don't you come to church with me? Not interested, thanks. Oh, why don't you come to this with me? Not interested, thanks. Eventually, she was like the persistent widow who kept bothering me, and eventually I agreed to go just so she would stop asking me. And I went to this church, and they would open up God's word, and they would just teach from it. They would preach and unpack it, and I was like, man, that's like fascinating. Like, these people actually want to learn. Like, they really think God spoke to them through this book, and they want to learn from it. And then I would see, like, talk with people, and they're like, oh, man, like, that really encouraged me, or, or I was built up by that. And here's what kind of happened in my heart over time as I, 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 as I was coming to this church with my sister. I saw God's people gathered together, sitting underneath the word of God, and I saw them gripped by God's word. I saw them in love with God and his word. I saw them convicted of sin by God's word. And I saw that they would respond to God's word in, in obedience. Not, not in perfection, but in obedience, which means they by faith repented of sin and believed upon Christ for forgiveness and mercy and righteousness. And that they would examine their lives with honesty and transparency. And in that, God began to free them from their idols. And I still question whether God was real. And if the God of the Bible was really the true God. But you know what was going on internally in my heart? Like, man, like these people are utterly convinced that God is real. And man, like if he is, he's really with these people. Like he's really here. Church, here is Paul's challenge for us to consider as we read this this morning. Am I living my life seeking gifts or a place in ministry for myself or for others? And if it's for others, there's a better way. Paul doesn't yell at them doesn't tell them how terrible they are and how they've ruined the church he started. No, he says, brothers, come to the way of Jesus. Come to him. Give this to him. Seek him. Seek his way of serving and loving others. Use the gifts that God has given you for others the way that Christ did. Repent and turn from your selfishness and by faith trust in Christ and follow his example. And as we do this, we won't be a perfect church. There'll be people that'll call us hypocrites. There'll be people that, that point fingers at us that don't like what's going on. But here's what I can promise us. If we, if we do this, we will worship God, and there will be others that will see that and declare this with us. God is really among you. Let's ask God if he would make that a reality for us, that he would really be among us, and that we might encourage one another but also encourage those outside with us. We're going to take this time now to, to do what we do every week here, and that's just respond to God and his word. So I'm going to lead us through a time of prayer and reflection. And then we'll take communion together. And then we'll finishing up by, by singing and worshiping with God. Let's pray. I would invite you right now just to spend a moment to, to pause and consider. Knowing that even the secret intentions of your heart, God sees. And so that there's no need to hide it, but you can bring it into the light. 
Will you just spend a few minutes praying and saying to God, God, am I selfish for certain gifts? Am I too self-centered? Do I design church or desire for church to be about me instead of about you and others? And if so, just take a moment to process through that, think through that, and then confess that to him. sit there pondering and working through this with the Lord. May you be reminded of the promises of God to you if you'll confess your sin and by faith take hold of the mercy and forgiveness promised to you by Jesus. God's word says this in Romans chapter 8. You know, if you're feeling guilty or beat down over this, he says this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Take a moment just to ponder and reflect on the promise of God to you in those verses. That although you were dead because of sin, God has made you alive in Christ and the promise of God is that he will raise your mortal body again. Just take a moment to thank him and accept that free gift that he gives you. As you sit and ponder through that and as you thank God for what he's done, I would invite you to go ahead and take communion right? as an act of worship. Right? Jesus promised that his flesh and his blood were being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And as we ponder through our own failure to live in light of love for one another, even with something as good as spiritual gifts, that the promise of God to us is that he is merciful in Christ. And so you can take the bread and the juice now 
thanking God for that promise of forgiveness in Christ. As you finish up taking your communion, will you just bow your head in prayer with me as we thank God for his goodness? <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. God, we confess that it is easy for us to take something even as beautiful as, as gifts that you give us as your children to be used to glorify you and serve others and we make them about us. We make them about our own selfish ambitions, our own desires, our own hurt. God, it seems crazy to think that, that we could take something so gracious and merciful and make it so ugly and evil. And yet, God, your promise to us is that your grace is sufficient. That what Christ did as he paid the price for our sin hanging on that cross. As he declared redemption, he declared mercy, he declared forgiveness over all those who are in him. God, will you meet us here now? as much as you say you do. And God, will you use that to ignite in us a heart of worship? Worship that seeks not our own feeling or emotion, but that elevates the glory and goodness of who you are. And will you make us a people
for our sin has been paid that you fulfilled it through the death and resurrection of your son in his life as well his perfect life thank you for the word that we heard from Kevin today uh, I ask that um, the things from you will stick with us Amen. and that your word would change our hearts and that our hearts would be changed for your service would you apply your word to our minds that we might not grow shallow, to our hearts that we might not grow cold, and to our hands and our feet, that this week and forward we might not just be hearers of your word, but doers also. We ask all this in the powerful and redemptive name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of quick announcements for you guys before uh, we head out. Um, if this is your first Sunday or you're looking for opportunities to get more connected to the life of the church, uh, I would encourage you to stop by the welcome table on your way out. Uh, Julia and Caroline would love uh, to help you get more connected, and you can fill out one of our connection cards, uh, and we can do something as simple as uh, leave a prayer request, and we can be praying for you, or if you're interested in joining one of our gospel communities, which are our groups that meet throughout the week, uh, where we gather together, uh, share a meal together, study God's word together, and pray together, uh, that's another great way to get connected to that. 
A couple of women's ministry announcements. The women's night out for this week is actually canceled because on April 1st, uh, there's going to be a woman's night of prayer uh, helping you prepare and uh, get ready for uh, Easter. And so um, this Sunday, this Friday canceled, but put on your cal- uh, calendar Friday, April 1st, and that will be at Grace Baptist Church on 39th Avenue. Uh, Easter is quickly approaching. I always tell you guys it's a great opportunity if you've got friends in your life who are not yet followers of Jesus uh, to invite them out. It's one of the few times a year where kind of it's culturally accepted and appropriate uh, to consider uh, the claims of Christianity, and we'll be doing a number of different things that week as a church to celebrate that. On Friday that week, uh, the gospel community groups will be gathering together to watch the Passion of the Christ. So if you wanted to do that, uh, you can fill out one of those connection cards in the back if you're not in a group already, and we can help you get connected with one of the groups that will be watching that movie that evening. And then on Saturday night, we'll be having a Seder supper. Um, that is actually limited, so you'll need to sign up for that. Uh, but we can help you get signed up for that as well if you're interested. And then Sunday, obviously, we will be here holding our Resurrection Sunday service together. Uh, lunch spots today, if you want to go grab lunch somewhere and meet some people from Alathia or just hang out, are uh, in Butler Plaza at Bole and Jersey Mike's. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here this morning. Uh, we love you. We're praying for you. Have a great week. Go and be the church. God bless.